Hey guys, so this video is on solubility and net ionic equations. <clears throat> so first of all, what does solubility mean? It means, well, the term solubility refers to how much of a substance will dissolve in a given amount of solvent. Um, it ends up that how much of that substance will dissolve in a given solvent depends on the temperature. Usually, um, heat makes more dissolve at a, um, in a given amount of solvent, but sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes when you heat a solution up, the solubility decreases. Um, real quick, um, we're not going to get into, into it in detail here yet, but in a later module. But the way that something dissolves, and I, we're talking ionic compounds, um, and well, mostly ionic compounds, although we can use this to refer to like um, a molecular compound dissolving in water too. But um, let's say this um, ionic compound is um, sodium chloride, where the yellow spheres would be the chloride ions with their negative charges, and the, the white spheres would be the sodium ions with their positive charges, and the, the red is the oxygen, the white is the hydrogen in the water molecules. Um, what happens is the water molecules, um, they have, it ends up there, um, they have little charges on them, positive and negative charges, and they, um, opposite charges attract each other, so the, the um, positive charge on the water molecule is attracted to the chloride ions with their negative charges, and they, they you know, turn around, point toward their positive ends towards the chloride ions and, and start to pull them away from the other sodium ions in the, the compound. When they do, they surround them and now it's dissolved. Same thing with the, the, um, the sodium ions. They're, um, they're pulled away by the negative ends of the water molecules and once they're pulled away, they're surrounded and um, then that's dissolved. That's real quick. We'll, we'll do that better um, in a later module. But that's solubility. So next, um, solubility rules. So here what we have is a table that you should memorize, put on your card, that lets you predict whether or not an ionic compound is soluble, whether or not it will dissolve in water. Um, we're going to do a lot better than this in Chem 102, but for now, this is what we use. Um, and the way you read this table is the first part here, the top, um, on the left, it says compounds that um, contain these um, atoms, elements, um, are soluble. And the right-hand column is any exception. So any compound where the cation is one of the group 1 metals, cations, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, or cesium, doesn't matter what the anion is, that's soluble, that dissolves in water. Likewise, if the cation is the ammonium ion, it's soluble. Um, any compounds where the anion is one of the three halides, chloride, bromide, or iodide, um, are soluble. doesn't matter what the cation is unless that cation is either silver, mercury-1, remember that exception, or lead-2. If, if the cation is any one of these three and the anion is one of these halides, then it's insoluble, not soluble. If the um, anion is a fluoride ion, um, it's soluble. The compound is soluble no matter what the cation is unless that cation is any one of the group two metal cations. So um, barium, um, calcium, you know, any of those in the group two. Magnesium, strontium. Um, so if, it, if, the cation, if the anion is fluoride and the cation is one of those group two metals, then it's insoluble. Also, if the cation is either lead two or iron three and the anion is fluoride, it's insoluble. Next, if the anion is either the acetate ion, this is right here, bicarbonate, HCO3 minus, nitrate, NO3 minus, or the chlorate ion, ClO3 minus. Doesn't matter what the cation is, no exceptions, those compounds are all soluble, they dissolve in water. If the anion is the sulfate ion, SO4 2 minus, um, then compound soluble, doesn't matter what the cation is, unless the cation is one of these listed here. Silver, mercury one, lead two, barium, calcium, or strontium. Now next, this kind of goes at it from the opposite direction. These compounds are all insoluble. They do not dissolve in water, except for the exceptions. So if the anion is either the carbonate ion, chromate, CrO4, two minus, phosphate, PO4, three minus, or sulfide, S2 minus, then those compounds are all insoluble. Doesn't matter what the cation is, unless it's one of the, except, one of the ones in this first rule up here. If the cation is lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, or ammonium, then even if the anion is one of these, it's still soluble, that compound is soluble. If the anion is hydroxide, 
then it's insoluble no matter what unless the cation is lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, or barium. So um, we'll, we'll get a chance to, to use these rules. They're, they're very useful. Um, they're generalizations. We do better in Chem 102, but for now, definitely memorize these. Put these on your card. Okay, so when something dissolves, dissociates in water, an ionic compound or an acid, um, it's either what we call a strong electrolyte or a weak electrolyte. So first of all, which ones are strong electrolytes? Well, if it's um, soluble based on those rules that we just looked at, so it's a, if it's a soluble ionic compound, then it's a strong electrolyte. If it's one of the seven, one of the seven, right, the strong acids, these are the are them listed here: hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic, nitric, chloric, chloric, sulfuric. Then it's a strong electrolyte. Um, what that means to be a strong electrolyte is that compound dissociates completely in water up to the limit of their solubility. There's always a limit um, on the solubility. Um, you, you can put enough in, like if you've ever put salt in water in a pot, put a little in and you can dissolve it pretty easily. But if you keep dumping it in, then eventually you reach a point where it won't dissolve anymore. Okay, that's the limit of solubility. Um, so um, if it's one of these strong, seven strong acids, or one of the soluble ionic compounds, it's a strong electrolyte, dissociates completely in water up to the limit of its solubility. Real quick, a footnote on the sulfuric acid. Um, sulfuric acid is what we call a diprotic acid. It has two hydrogens in front here. Only the first one is strong. The second one, it's, it's pretty hard to, to take off, and it's not, we don't call that a strong acid, just the first one is. We say the first proton, um, first acidic proton is a strong. A strong. So what's an acid? Well, um, we're going to start with this definition here, and in Chem 102, we'll do a lot better um, and make some more specific definitions. But for now, guys, an acid is something that when you put it into water, it produces either the hydrogen ion, H+, um, which we also write as the hydronium ion, H3O+. These two, you guys, are interchangeable, hydrogen ion, H3O+, hydronium, for us for now. Um, so, for example, if you put hydrochloric acid in water, what happens is, um, one way of describing what happens is, is the hydrogen ion um, is pulled off away from hydrochloric acid and attaches to the water molecule, producing the hydronium ion, leaving behind the chloride ion. It's an acid because it produces hydronium. A base is something that, for now, when you put it into water, produces hydroxide. Um, so, for example, when you put sodium hydroxide into water, it dissociates into the sodium ion and the hydroxide ion. It produces hydroxide, it's a base. Okay, so those are strong electrolytes. Weak electrolytes um, do not completely dissociate, they partially dissociate in, in water. Um, and because of that, they exhibit what we call a dynamic equilibrium. Once more, we'll get into this in much more detail in Chem 102. But the basic idea with a dynamic equilibrium, it's easiest for me to talk about it with an example. So, uh, a, an example of a weak electrolyte would be a weak acid. What's a weak acid? Well, it's any acid that's not, the, not one of the seven. So, for example, acetic acid. Um, it's not one of the seven, but it is an acid. It's a weak acid. What that means is when you put acetic acid into water, um, it, the, all, all of the molecules of acetic acid do not dissociate into the hydrogen ion and the acetate ion. Some of them do about you know, one out of 10,000 or so, but um, the, most of them remain as, you know, stuck together as the acetic acid molecule. And also, again, we'll get into much more detail in Chem 102, but what, this dynamic equilibrium, first of all, we represent it with these double arrows pointing both ways. And what it means is that when this molecule dissociates, the ones that do dissociate and produce the hydrogen ion and the acetate ion, those guys are floating around in the water, but then they might bump in, the hydrogen ion might bump into another acetate ion, and then they stick, and now they're not apart, and they go back and they reform the acetic acid molecule. And it's going back and forth. The concentration of these guys stays the same, but if you could see the individual atoms, you would see them moving back and forth like that. Again, much more detail in Chem 102. So another weak electrolyte would be any partially soluble ionic compound. Um, we'll get into that later, um, but just I want to put that there because it belongs right there. Okay, another example of a weak electrolyte would be a molecular base. 
Um, a molecular base is, for net, right now, it's going to be, um, a, well, a molecular compound means it's not an ionic compound, so it's not a metal hydroxide. And the ones we're going to see now all contain nitrogen. That's the key. If you see nitrogen in a molecular compound, start thinking about that it might be a base. And what a molecular base does is it produces hydroxide, that's what makes it a base, by pulling a proton, a hydrogen ion, off of water. And so what's happening here is this ammonia molecule, this is ammonia, the nitrogen atom pulls a hydrogen ion off of water, makes ammonium, the ammonium ion, leaving behind hydroxide. That's why it's a base. Um, we, we use models like this to describe um, molecules sometimes because it gives a real good visual picture. This would be ammonia. The N is the purple part. White parts are the hydrogens. There's water. So one of these white spheres, one of the hydrogen atoms, ions, is pulled off. Now it's stuck on ammonia, making ammonium, leaving behind hydroxide. Those are weak electrolytes. So, an example. What are the products of the following chemical reaction? And how does this relate to solubility? Well, you'll see. So, if you guys would, um, so the way you know how to do this um, is going to involve um, classifying the reaction like we did before, and then that's going to help you figure out what the products are. And then once you do this, that the apply the solubility rules. Um, <clears throat> remember, one of the things we talked about back in the um, when we talked about um, double replacement reactions is that uh, the reaction does not occur if all the products are aqueous. Just keep that in mind. So go ahead and pause the video, figure it out. Come back when you're done. Welcome back. So. Iron 2 acetate and gold 3 nitrate. Um, first of all, um, we do the double replacement reaction thing where we switch the cations. So now iron 2 goes with nitrate, makes iron 2 nitrate. Gold 3 goes with acetate to make gold 3 acetate. And I balanced the equation here, you guys should too. But when, I, when we apply the solubility rules to these two compounds over here, iron 2 nitrate, gold 3 acetate, we see that they're both soluble. That's why we write AQ. Aqueous means that they're soluble, by the way. And because everything here is aqueous, soluble, there is no reaction. Okay, so we write no reaction, no products. All right, next, molecular, total ionic, and net ionic equations. So when we say molecular equation um, in this context, we mean the the normal chemical equation we've been writing and balancing so far. So for example, in the reaction between the double replacement reaction between silver nitrate and potassium phosphate to form solid silver phosphate and potassium nitrate, this one does occur because one of the products is not aqueous, it's solid. Um, that's the molecular equation. So the complete ionic equation means just any compound that's soluble based on the solubility rules and include the strong acids in that. Um, you write To write the complete ionic equation, you write it as its separate ions. So silver nitrate is soluble, so we have the silver ion and the nitrate ion. And this three up front here, guys, means there's three, three silver ions and three nitrate ions. Likewise, for potassium phosphate, we have three potassiums and one phosphate. Don't break apart polyatomic ions, just break apart them into the cations and the anions. Now over here, silver phosphate, that's not soluble, so we don't break it apart, we just leave it as is. But potassium nitrate is, it's aqueous, so we have three potassium ions and three nitrate ions. So now what we do to get the net ionic equation is we cross out anything in the complete ionic equation that is identical on both sides of the arrow. So for us, that's gonna be three nitrates, that's gone and also the three potassiums. What we're left with, guys, is the net ionic equation. So it's three silvers plus phosphate makes solid silver phosphate. Now, net ionic equations are really nice. Several reasons. Um, one thing is that they focus on the chemistry that's happening. All of the other species that are in the complete ionic equation but are not in the net ionic equation um, we call spectator ions. So anything we crossed out 
are what we call spectator items. That's important to remember that name. Um, so the net ionic equation focuses on the chemistry. Also, we're going to see as we go through this class and Chem 102, we'll come to certain um, topics where it's so much easier just to use the net ionic, equa ionic equation instead of the molecular equation, and you'll see those when we get there. All right, so now, an example. So write the net ionic equation for the reaction between aqueous lead 2 chlorate, chlorate and aqueous potassium sulfate. So if you would guys, please go ahead and pause the video, work on that, come back when you're done. And welcome back. Let's look at the answer. So um, the way you write a net ionic equation is you first write the molecular equation. And to do that, um, we had to figure out first what the formulas for the reactants are. So lead 2 chlorate ends up being this. Potassium phosphate, uh, excuse me, sulfate is this. And I applied the solubility rules to those, and I saw that they're both soluble, so I wrote aqueous. Then, because this is a double replacement reaction, to figure out what the products are, guys, we switched the cations. So now lead 2 goes with sulfate, that gave me lead 2 sulfate here, and potassium goes with chlorate, that gave me potassium chlorate here. I applied the solubility rules, I saw that potassium chlorate is soluble, so I write aqueous, but I saw that lead 2 sulfate is not, it's insoluble, solid. You guys definitely go back and look at those rules and make sure you see why that's true. So I write S for a solid. That's what you write when something is insoluble. It's S for solid. Then I balanced it, and I have my molecular equation. I wrote my complete ionic equation by dissociating into the cations and the anions anything that's soluble. I wrote aqueous. So I had lead two ion, two chlorates from here, two, two potassiums from here, sulfate, two potassiums from here, two chlorates, and then I did not break apart the lead two sulfate because it's not soluble, solid. Then I crossed out everything that was the same on both sides. What, what, what I was left with, with is this, the net ionic equation. Well, that's all there is to it, guys.